When it comes to bailouts of American business, Barney Frank and the Congress may be just getting started. Nearly two trillion tax dollars have been shoveled into the hole that Wall Street dug, and people wonder, where's the bottom? It turns out the abyss is deeper than most people think, because there is a second mortgage shock heading for the economy. In the executive suites of Wall Street and Washington, you're beginning to hear alarm about a new wave of mortgages with strange names that are about to become all too familiar. If you thought subprimes were insanely reckless, wait till you hear what's coming. What's the future hold? Well, this shows... One of the best guides to the danger ahead is Whitney Tilson. He's an investment fund manager who's made such a name for himself recently that these investors, who manage about $10 billion, gathered to hear him last week. Tilson saw a year ago that subprime mortgages were just the start. We had the greatest asset bubble in history, and now that bubble is bursting. The single biggest piece of the bubble is the U.S. mortgage market and we're probably about halfway through the unwinding and bursting of that bubble. Halfway. It may seem like all the carnage out there, we must be almost finished, but there's still a lot of pain to come um, in terms of write downs and losses that have yet to be recognized. In 2007, Tilson teamed up with Amherst Securities, an investment firm that specializes in mortgages. Amherst had done some financial detective work analyzing the millions of mortgages that were bundled into those mortgage-backed securities that Wall Street was peddling. It found that the subprimes, loans to the least creditworthy borrowers, were defaulting. But Amherst also ran the numbers on what were supposed to be higher quality mortgages. And they were frankly terrifying as data we'd never seen before. And that's what made us realize, holy cow, things are going to be much worse than anyone anticipates. The trouble now is that the insanity didn't end with the subprimes. There were two other kinds of exotic mortgages that became popular, called Alt A's and Option Arms. The Option Arms, in particular, lured borrowers in with ultra-low initial interest rates, called teaser rates, sometimes as low as 1%. But after two, three, or five years, those rates reset. They went up, and so did the monthly payment. So a mortgage of, say, $800 a month could easily jump to $1,500. Now the Alte and Option Arm loans made back in the heyday are starting to reset, causing the mortgage payments to go up and homeowners to default. The defaults right now are, are incredibly high at unprecedented levels, and there's no evidence that the default rate is tapering off. Those defaults almost inevitably are leading to foreclosures and homes being auctioned and home prices continuing to fall. What you seem to be saying is that there is a very predictable time bomb effect here. Exactly. I mean, you can look back at what was written in 05 and 07, you can look at the reset dates, you can look at the current default rates, and it's really very clear and predictable what's going to happen here. Just look at this projection from the Investment Bank of Credit Suisse. These are the billions of dollars in subprime mortgages that reset last year and this year. Now look at what hasn't hit yet the Alt-A and Option Arm resets when homeowners will pay higher interest rates in the next three years. We're at the beginning of a second wave. How big is the potential damage from the Alt-A's compared to what we just saw in the subprimes? Well, the subprime was approaching a trillion. The Alt-A is about a trillion. Um, and then you have Option Arms on top of that. Uh, that's probably another five to six hundred billion on top of that. How many of these Option Arms would you imagine are going to fail? Well north of 50 percent. My gut would be 70 percent of these Option Arms will default. How do you know that? We know it based on current default rates. And this is before the reset. So people are defaulting even on the, the little 3% teaser interest-only rates they're being asked to pay today. That second wave is coming ashore at a place you might call the Repo Riviera, Miami-Dade County. Oscar Munoz used to sell real estate. Now his company clears out foreclosed homes. The business is just going through the roof for us. Fortunately for us, unfortunately for the poor families who are going through this. I wonder, do you ever come to houses where the people are still here? Absolutely. That's, that's really a sad situation. I'd rather not meet the people. Why not? It's not easy to, to come in and, and move a family out. It's, it's just our job to do it for the bank.
It, it's, it's just the nature of, of what's going on in the market right now. What is going on in the market right now? How much work are you getting? Every day we have 20, 30 assignments. A day? A, a day. Just your company? Just our company. And we're one of the few companies right now who are hiring. We, hire, we have to hire people because the demand is, is so high. People who've been evicted tend to leave stuff behind. The next house is usually much smaller. Banks hire Munoz to move the possessions out where, by law, they remain for 24 hours. Often the neighbors pick through the remains. Once the homes are empty, the hard part starts, trying to find buyers in a free-fall market. Miami real estate broker Peter Zalewski talks like a man with a lot of real estate to move. We have 110,000 properties for sale in South Florida today, 55,000 foreclosures, 19,000 bank-owned properties, 68% of the available inventory is in some form of distress. They need someone to clean it up. What's the name of your company? It's called Condo Vultures Realty. What does that mean? That in times of distress, in times of uh, downturn, there's opportunity. And, um, you know, vultures are clean up the mess. A lot of people seem to think they kill, but they don't actually kill, they clean. The killing in Miami was done by the developers back when it seemed that the party would never end. They sold hyperinflated condos at what amounted to real estate orgies, sales parties for invited guests who were armed with option arm and Alte loans. There were red ropes out outside. They had hired cameramen and they had hired photographers to almost set the scene of a paparazzi. They were hiring fake paparazzi to, to make the customers feel like they were special. You were selling a lifestyle. What role did these exotic mortgages play, these Alt-A's and the Option R's? They were essential. They were necessary. Without the Alt-A or Option R mortgage, this boom never would have occurred. It never would have occurred because without the Alt-A's and the Option R's, many buyers never would have qualified for a loan. The banks and the brokers were getting their money up front in fees. So the more they wrote, the more they made. They stopped checking whether the income was even real. They turned to low and no-doc loans, so-called liar's loans, uh, and jokingly referred to as ninja loans. No income, no job, no assets, and they were still willing to lend. But help me out here. How does that make sense right. for the lender? It yeah. would seem to be reckless in the extreme. It was, but the key assumption underlying the willingness to do this was that home prices would keep going up forever. And in fact, home prices nationwide had never declined since the Great Depression. On the way up, everyone wanted in. No one expected to feel any pain. People like acupuncturist Rula Geosmus became real estate speculators. How many properties did you buy in this last five-year period? I believe in the last five-year period, I bought about six properties. And what did you buy them for? For investments. She says she put 20% down on each. Now they're all financed with option arm loans. What did you understand about the loans? Well, unfortunately, I didn't ask too many questions. I mean, in the old days, I would shop around, but because of the frenzy, and I was so busy looking to buy other properties, I didn't really focus on shopping around for mortgage brokers. But if you're investing in real estate, you're buying multiple properties, you should be asking a lot of questions. Yeah. Why didn't you ask? I was busy. I was really busy looking at property all the time, all day long. Did you read the paperwork? Uh, no, I didn't. Now, she's losing money on every property. You know that there are people watching this interview who are saying, you know, she was just foolish. She was greedy and foolish. She was buying small apartment buildings and wasn't paying enough attention to how they were financed. My full-time job is I'm an acupuncturist. So this is just a side thing. You're an acupuncturist, but you got stuck in real estate. Yeah. Geosma says she was misled and she hopes to renegotiate her loans. But many other buyers have simply walked away from their properties. This Miami luxury building was a sellout, but when we visited, a quarter of the condos were in foreclosure. What did this place go for? This was originally purchased in October of 2006 for $2.4 million. $2.4 million? What's it worth now? Uh, the asking price from the lender is nine thirty nine. dollars So it lost a million and a half dollars in value? A couple of years? It was a tough two years. And there are tough years to come. Because just like the subprimes, the Alt-A and option arm mortgages were bundled into Wall Street securities and sold to investors. In a nutshell, 2009 looks like what to you? Miserable. 2010. Miserable, even worse. Sean Egan runs a credit rating firm that analyzes corporate debt. Fortune magazine cited Egan as one of six Wall Street pros who predicted the fall of the financial giants. 
This next wave of defaults, which everyone agrees is inevitably going to happen, how central is that to what happens to the rest of the economy? It's core. It's core because housing is such an important part. Um, we're not going to get the housing industry back on track until we clear out this garbage that's in there. That hasn't cleared out yet. In fact, we haven't seen the bottom. It's getting worse. What do you mean? There are some statistics from the National Association of Realtors, and they track the, the supply of housing units on the market. And that's grown from 2.2 million units about three years ago up to 4.5 million uh, units earlier this year. So uh, you, have, you have the massive supply out there of, of units uh, that need to be sold. Well, with the housing supply increasing that much, what does it mean? It means that this problem, the economic difficulties, are not going to be resolved in a short period of time. It's not going to take six months. It's not going to take 12 months. We're looking at probably about three, four, or five years before this overhang, the supply overhang, is worked through. In the next four years, eight million American families are expected to lose their homes. But even after the residential meltdown, Whitney Tilson says blows to the financial system will keep coming. The same craziness that occurred in the mortgage market occurred in the commercial real estate market. And that's taking a little longer to, to show, but, but there are going to be big losses there. Credit cards, auto loans, you name it. So we're maybe halfway through the mortgage bubble, but we may only be in the third inning of the overall bursting of this asset bubble. Does that mean that the stock market is going to continue plunging as we've seen the last several months? Actually, we're the most bullish uh, we've been in 10 years of managing money. And the reason is, is because the stock market, for the first time, I can say this in years, has finally figured out how bad things are going to be. And the stock market is forward looking. And with U.S. stocks down uh, nearly 50% from their highs, we're actually finding bargains galore. We think corporate America is on sale. The stock market will still have a lot of figuring to do with more troubling news on the horizon. The Mortgage Bankers Association says one out of ten Americans is now behind on their mortgage. That's the most since they started keeping records in 1979.